Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Frayne Olson is our market analyst. Our Barnaby from Kansas State joins us to talk about crop insurance. We'll look at feed costs and other issues in the pork and dairy industries. And Curtis Harms reports on a new partnership between Nebraska and China. Grain markets tumbled on Monday and Tuesday before resurfacing Wednesday. On Thursday morning, we talked with Frain Olson about wheat production here and abroad, the balance between corn and wheat for feed use, and what signs to look for that may signal grain markets are headed downward. Well, that's always the big challenge. Everybody wants to know when the peak of the market is in because that's when they'd like to sell everything. But, you know, predicting that is almost impossible. There is one guideline that I try and use, though, to, as, as I've talked to farmers, to get a reference point. Right now, because we are in such a weather market and everybody's dominated by trying to forecast what their yield expectations are going to be and, and therefore what prices have to be to ration use, uh, the, the rule of thumb that I'm using is as long as the, the reports coming out of yield forecast, yield predictions continue to drop, uh, commodity prices will stay strong and, and move upward. But about that time when it looks like the uh, yield forecasts are starting to flatten out or stabilize a bit, that my, my suggestion, my bias is that that will be when prices will probably peak out. The, and it seems like we're still on the downward end of that. Yep, and, and what happens is the futures market tends to get a little ahead of the cash market, in particular in these kinds of conditions. And so the pendulum tends to swing a little bit too high on the upward side before retracing a bit. Let's move into the wheat market and uh, specifically let's go to North Dakota where harvest is underway. And what are you seeing there for yields? Yeah, we're just, just getting started in spring wheat harvest. Um, the early reports we're getting out of uh, the, the farming community right now is that Yields are pretty good. Everybody's been a bit surprised and pleased. Um, at least the early early fields were. Uh, quality has been very good. Uh, test weights and proteins have been, have been good. Uh, I suspect, though, as we start moving into the later phases of harvest, we might might see some yield drag going on because we did have some hot and dry weather appear at a kind of a critical stage for some of the later crop. But right now, everybody's uh, pretty pleased with the wheat harvest and uh, hoping that uh, that that continues. Miles better than last year, at least. Yeah, uh, much better than last year. Uh, the wheat crop got, got in a lot earlier this year from a planting date standpoint, and planting progress is very quick. Uh, we had enough soil reserves, soil moisture reserves, that uh, the wheat crop made it without too much stress. Let's take a look to the North Frain and internationally in Canada. How strong do you think that crop will be? Well, the reports coming out of Canada are very similar to North Dakota. They got a, in the fields a little bit later than we did because they had a little wetter conditions but they've actually had a very good growing season as well. So the current expectations are that the Canadian wheat crop is, is also going to be uh, very good uh, yields as well as pretty good quality at this point. In fact, I hate to say this, but there are a few parts in Canada that are complaining because it's getting a little bit too wet. How dare you, Frayne. <laughs> Let's move to the Black Sea region. Uh, is there going to be enough competition there that exports are going to be tight? That is one of the things that the wheat market is looking at very closely right now. As we've, up, up until this point, the wheat market has really been a follower to corn and soybeans, again, because of the, of the competition going on in the feed market. Um, but the other underlying issue is, is what's happening in the Black Sea region. Um, again, Black Sea region has both winter wheat and spring wheat growing regions. The winter wheat region um, has had some problems earlier on. The spring wheat region right now is in that flowering reproductive stage, and, and that core region is also getting very hot and dry at this point. 
So there are a few rumors that are starting to appear that, that the Black Sea region, in particular Russia, may uh, put another export ban on. Uh, right now, my view is that that might be a little bit premature. Uh, but again, if the conditions uh, merit it, that, that may be something that we look at. And that's really important, to be very honest, with, uh, for the winter wheat crop. Uh, winter wheat marketings, uh, especially in the southern plains, uh, that Black Sea region competes with some of our major uh, market outlets in the international stage. You mentioned uh, wheat for feed use. Let's talk about that more because if corn keeps continuing to go up or to rise, how much of a, uh, a substitution could we see there? Maybe internationally more so than domestically? Yes, correct. One of the things in the, in the U.S. we always look at corn as our primary feed and we don't always think about wheat as a, as a feed substitute. There are a few livestock producers that will do that, but it's really a, a minority. But if you shift to the international stage, feed wheat is actually a very common source, uh, an alternative to corn internationally. And so one of the things is as the yield expectations keep dropping in the states and we start looking at how do we ration demand, um, you know, the export market is one of those that we pay attention to. And as corn prices come up, all of a sudden internationally, feed wheat becomes a, a very viable alternative and internationally that's not a common, uh, an uncommon thing to do. So uh, obviously if we can get some more feed, uh, feed usage in the international markets, that opens the door for additional export pace from the, the wheat sector here in the U.S. Darren Newsom from DTN will join us next week to look at corn and soybean markets. Crop conditions across Nebraska continue to deteriorate. The latest USDA NAS report labeled 32% of soybeans and 33% of corn as poor to very poor. With yields continuing to decrease, farmers this year will be forced to lean on crop insurance. Because this year's payments should surpass the $10.8 billion paid to farmers last year, there's concern that insurance companies won't be able to pay the whole bill. Art Barnaby from Kansas State dismissed that possibility when we talked Thursday. Art said the other common question from farmers regarding this year's revenue protection coverage was the maximum price limit their contract would cover. Well, first of all, it's based on the harvest price, which we expect to be higher than the spring price, and it's measured during the month of October for this part of the country. Um, for corn, uh, that price would have to exceed $11.36, and for soybeans, it would have to exceed $25.10. Um, currently, neither uh, market is anywhere close to the limits, um, and I really don't expect us to exceed the limits. If somebody's really concerned about it, they could go out and buy $11.30 calls on their corn uh, and turn their insurance contract into an un unlimited contract, but I'm not recommending that. There's a possibility here that if the harvest price does go up and yields continue to go down, that farmers could come out, some farmers could come out fairly well from this, yes? Better than they did in 1988, which was the last big drought. And in 1988, most of the coverage was yield only at 65% and very few acres covered. In some states, less than 15% of the acres. Uh, fast forward to this year, on average, more than 80% of the corn acres are insured. Uh, and most of it's insured with revenue protection and most bought the harvest price. So um, not only are there more people insured, but at a higher coverage level, typically 75 to 80 percent, and they're being paid based on the market price rather than a price set six months earlier. Now that's a point of discontent for some because they believe that uh, farmers are going to come out ahead on this thing. But as you mentioned, the one thing that people aren't talking about is people who need that corn to feed. So talk about how this relates to the current discussion. Well, first of all, most farmers have anywhere from a 20 to 25 percent deductible off the top, so you need prices to go up 20 percent. 20% just to um, get back to the same level. Uh, very seldom do you come out better with a crop loss than actually raising a crop. Uh, having said that, if you uh, are a diversified farm with both livestock and uh, crops and you need that corn to feed your dairy cows or your pigs or, or farmer background lot, that sort of thing, then you're going to have to buy back that corn not at a forecasted price back in March, but today's market price uh, should your crop fail. Do you have an idea of what we're looking at in terms of total, and obviously the season's not over yet, but what we could be looking at for a total loss, and is there a concern that uh, crop insurers won't be able to pay out all of it? 
let me answer the second question first. Uh, crop insurance companies, uh, after the failure of a company about 10 years ago, must now uh, provide documentation to RMA that they can survive two catastrophic losses uh, and with sufficient reserves and our reinsurance coverage. So these companies um, have the capacity to cover this loss. The other thing that's really changed is in recent years, um, large companies such as Wells Fargo and uh, Ace, um, QBE, some of the bigger uh, international companies now own the crop insurance companies in the U.S. Um, they are a really large organization and the crop insurance part of their portfolio is really a very small part of it. So I don't see any chance that they cannot uh, make these claims. The small companies, if uh, somebody should fail, um, and I don't really expect that either because they buy reinsurance, uh, but if that should happen, uh, ultimately the federal government's obligated uh, to take it over. Uh, right now, I'm estimating somewhere between 10 and $15 billion underwriting loss this year. You can see our full interview with Art on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash market journal. Tina Barrett says too many producers don't pencil out the cost of production in their operations. In the July Nebraska Farmer, Barrett explains the importance of cost of production data to set your farm apart from your neighbors. Barrett, the director of Nebraska Farm Business, says when it comes time for you or your neighbor to compete in buying or renting a piece of land, knowing the cost of production can make the difference. You can read more about her thoughts in the July Nebraska Farmer. One of those costs for livestock producers is the input of feeds such as corn, soybeans, and other forages. We'll look at alternatives for pig producers in a minute, but first we look at the dairy industry. While cows in the feedlot and pigs in the barn may be able to live, although not thrive, on different rations, dairy cows are arguably more affected because they must continue to produce enough milk to turn a profit. We looked at that concern and others this week with Dan Rice at Prairie Land Dairy. Our feed inputs are about 40% of our costs. We can, uh, we can be profitable. Right now our feed input costs are running about 65% of our income. Uh, not profitable at all. So it's a huge concern for our industry and how long and how much equity a dairy farm has to stay in business. With milk prices, what do you expect to see for the consumer? We know that consumers are gonna face increasing food prices. But for milk specifically, how high could it get or, or how bad could it get? We don't really know that answer. At some point, the consumers will leave the milk category and go to a, a, a cheaper nutrition. Uh, we don't know where, at what point that happens, but milk prices definitely have to increase just to cover our costs. Rice says although production at Prairie Land Dairy is only down about 2%, output across the country has fallen by 5 to 15% because of the heat. Now moving to the pig industry. The Sterling Pork Profit Tracker reported farrow to finish producers recorded a positive margin of just under $22 a head last week. That's down $5.74 from the previous week and only half of what it was a month ago. In spring and even early summer, a high number of planted corn and soybean acres opened the possibility that feeders might get a break on feed costs. But as we mentioned when talking with Dwayne Reese in the Animal Science Building here on East Campus Wednesday, Things now aren't nearly as bright. Clearly not. Uh, in fact, just you know, in June, uh, corn was four dollars a bushel. Now it's about eight. Uh, soybean meal uh, producers were uh, pricing that in about three seventy-five a ton. Now we're looking at five fifty. Uh, so those are huge differences in the, the price in just a few weeks. How much shift does that put on the individual pig? If you're feeding out, you know, how much impact can that have? Yeah, you know, well, if you're a fair to finish producer, uh, it's going to add $25, $30 uh, in production costs per pig. And so break evens uh, have substantially jumped, and the market has not responded all that well to cover those. So uh, it leaves uh, pork producers in a lurch. And one of the things that we're looking at today as an alternative is, is trying to find some change up maybe in a feed diet that would ease costs a bit. And we can look at it from corn and soybean meal both. Let's start with corn. Is there any alternative to corn that would ease cost? Well, uh, uh, here's DGGS again. You know, we've talked about DGGS before. A lot of producers are using it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the price of DGGS relative to corn is about 105, 110%, which is the highest it's been in oh, two, two, three years. So, you know, even DGGS is not looking all that favorable uh, to come into the diet. 
That doesn't mean it's not economical. Mm -hmm. It's just not near as economical as it used to be to put in the diet. Maybe internationally more so, but feed wheat is starting to play more of a role probably. Is there any role that it can have in the hog diet? Sure, and a lot of it depends on uh, your, your proximity to where the wheat is. Wheat does come in the diet, uh, has come in the diet for a few people. That's very key, very few people, certainly not compared to DGGS. DGGS would be much more uh, utilized or widely utilized than wheat. Uh, wheat works great in uh, swine diets. Uh, get the diets formulated correctly, performance will be maintained, and if you get it bought right relative to corn, then it'll lower the cost of the diet. Let's look at soybean meal. What can be done there? Because we might have supply issues there as well. Well, uh, we're going to need to rely on crystalline forms of amino acids. We've done that before, and what's different this time is we're looking at a fourth uh, crystalline form of amino acid that hasn't been used all that much previously in swine diets because, uh, well, its cost relative to that from soybean meal has not been favorable. What I'm talking about is tryptophan. Tryptophan hasn't been used uh, all that much in pig diets for the reasons I just mentioned. So we'd be looking at bringing in lysine, threonine, methionine, and then this fourth one, tryptophan. How much can that throw the diet off in terms of what you're trying to get overall? I mean, do you need to work with a nutritionist to make sure you're, you're keeping track of what you're putting in here? Yeah, you're, you, you, when you're working with these crystalline forms of amino acids, you're working with very minute amount, very minute amounts of those in the feed, and they're critical for uh, growth, reproduction, feed efficiency. So uh, the, the amount of those that's in the diet uh, has to be uh, well thought out and uh, well very done. Very deliberate. Very deliberate. Right. Because if you don't get those in the diet in, in the correct proportions, or you don't have the proper balance of those amino mm -hmm. acids in the diet, then pig performance won't be as you expect. So instead of driving down feed costs and maintaining pig performance, you could be driving down feed costs right. and also driving down performance, and you may not be ahead at all. Let's quickly look at what you can do once the feed is in the bin. What can you do to make sure you're being as efficient as possible with that animal? First and foremost, we want to start with feed particle size. We want the uh, 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 particle size of the feed be 600, 700 microns on average. Uh, that's because uh, uh, if, we, if we get the particle size down far enough, then the enzymes that's in the digestive tract can go in and extract the nutrients out of the grain before they get into the lower or the upper part of the sorry, the lower part of the small mm -hmm. intestine, large intestine, then, then go out as manure. As far as slaughter weights, is there anything to keep in mind, maybe pushing it through a little quicker? Clearly, we want to be watching uh, our market weights because uh, it's clear that pigs deposit more fat as they approach uh, maturity. And it takes a lot of energy to produce fat. So we want to be very careful, very current on our marketings and not produce excess fat. Reese says none of the feed alternatives we mentioned seem to affect taste for the pig. He also says one other way producers can improve feed efficiency is to cover only a third of the feeder pan to minimize waste. Over this last month, Market Journal has shown you interviews and footage from our recent trip to China. While we were in China, Curtis and I also accompanied the Nebraska Department of Ag and the Vice Chancellor of UNL's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources as they prepared to open a joint exchange office in Beijing. Curtis Harms has more. Nebraska and China will soon be solving world food challenges together. This is all thanks to a new collaboration between Nebraska's Department of Agriculture, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and China's State Administration of Grain. For nearly a decade, the Nebraska Department of Ag and the governor have been working with the Chinese government to establish the state as a credible and reliable partner in the Chinese marketplace. These efforts have paid off as the new research office was opened on June 11th. The director for the Nebraska Department of Ag, Greg Iba, says China's state administration of grain is similar in scope to the USDA. It is a cabinet-level department in China charged with controlling the food grains in the country. Everything from dry beans to corn and soybeans and wheat, they maintain the stockpiles for emergency reserves that China has as well as work on research and development for preservation and post-harvest processing and new technology that will help them in that area for even new food product development. 
China has a growing population and more food will be needed to meet demand. The Nebraska-China collaboration will address these concerns and examine how Nebraska can help. By collaborating with them, we have opportunities to work on the private and commercial side with the, where the Department of Ag will get involved uh, with uh, selling products and making uh, some of our uh, feed and, uh, and food available to them. Due to regulations in China, the state of Nebraska couldn't have an office in China, but the University of Nebraska-Lincoln could. Therefore, Nebraska's Department of Ag partnered with UNL. UNL's Harlan Vice Chancellor for IANR, Ronnie Green, says the Chinese partnership is significant to the university. It's important to the university because if we're going to really um, work to solve the, the world challenges around food production and around agricultural production, we can't do it all here. I mean, we, we're not going to, to feed the entire world from, from the U.S. or from Nebraska. It's going to, we're going to have to also work to help other regions of the world um, become food secure and to, to increase their productive capacity as well. As a result of the partnership, UNL students will benefit. Dr. Green says it's important for graduates to gain a global perspective while they're at the university. The potential for agricultural research is limitless with this collaboration, which may impact faculty members and students from several departments. Some examples of things that we're looking at are some, some areas of grain safety, food safety research, uh, in particularly in grain losses that they have in storage. We uh, anticipate working with the Ministry of Water in China that handles everything to do with the wa their water resources. Uh, and with the Ministry of Agriculture, which deals with production agriculture, so the pre-harvest uh, and production side. So a, a combination of all of those creates a, quite a great opportunity for us to, uh, to work with them in China. The partnership between the Nebraska Department of Ag, UNL, and China's State Administration of Grain isn't a common collaboration. In fact, this agreement is the first of its kind. Now, lots of states have invested in trade missions and tra built relationships in China with companies and with government. But this is the first time that a state and a university has actually opened an office and has a presence within a Chinese government entity. So that gives us a different level of acceptance of, you know, kind of a pseudo Chinese government endorsement, if you will and gives us a, a very uh, distinct advantage over other states and universities that don't have that relationship. Both IBA and Green see this joint effort between Nebraska and China to last well into the future. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. Green says most of the research conducted as part of this partnership will be done through a network of Chinese universities coordinated by China's State Administration of Grain. Also with us during our time in Beijing was Nebraska's Agricultural Trade Representative, Stan Garbitz, seen here on the far left, who was heavily involved in the partnership and the opening of the office. And now to forecast the last days of July and the first days of August, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again, it's time for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, bring you up to date on current crop conditions across the state. Nebraska Ag Statistics is reporting as of Sunday that only 9% of the dryland corn crop in Nebraska was in the good to excellent category. That's a drop of about 16 points from the previous week. And we've also seen a drop in our irrigated uh, good to excellent ratings. We're now down in the 50 to 55% range, which is about a 10% drop from the previous week. And we've seen a wide expansive area of drought encompassing the entire Corn Belt outside of the extreme northern portions of the Corn Belt, primarily mostly centered around Minnesota. Let's take a look at the drought monitor to see where we're standing currently and what we can expect as we go forward in time. And for Nebraska, you'll notice there's a lot of reds painted here and across the western part of the state, indicating that we're seeing D3 category or what we would call extreme drought, which indicates at least a primary loss of 50% of the agricultural crops that are grown in that region, whether it be hay, whether it be corn, something is taking a 50% cut at minimum. And in the small area of central Nebraska, we are indicating that there is some D4 categorization, which is exceptional drought, indicating at least a 70% reduction. And some of that uh, eastern Nebraska, where we see the D2, we've seen a rapid deterioration of conditions, but right now we're indicating uh, an estimated loss on average of around 30% 
for the dry land crop, and this could get worse if we don't see some significant moisture. So as we go for today, what we notice is a ridge to our south that has been primarily impacting us for the last month, and it has sagged just enough that we may see some ridge runners coming across the periphery of this ridge that might impact northern and northeastern Nebraska this afternoon, but it's going to be very isolated in nature. We're going to be see highs that are going to be primarily in the mid-90s across the east to possibly the low 100 degree ratings across west portions of western and southwestern Nebraska. Now as we go into tomorrow, we'll see that that ridge remains in its place, actually lifts just a slightly north and we'll see temperatures increasing to around 97 across the east to around 105 in isolated locations of western Nebraska. As we go into Monday, we're going to see that ridge kind of move its way a little bit toward the southwest and that's going to allow some moisture to run over the top. So it looks like northeast and east central Nebraska has the best opportunity for scattered precipitation, primarily in the late afternoon hours. It's going to be isolated, about 20 to 30 percent chance, but at least there's a chance for moisture. Less so across western Nebraska. We're looking at highs primarily mid-90s across northeastern Nebraska to around 102 across western Nebraska. As so we go into Tuesday, that ridge is still in place. We still get some ridge runners that might impact eastern Nebraska. We're looking at highs 95 northeast to around 105 west. As we go into Wednesday, we start to see the ridge moving back toward the north. And that's going to increase our temperature somewhat. East will be between 95 and 98. In the west, somewhere between 100 and 105. As we go into Thursday, the ridge builds slightly toward the east, but there is a little bit of moisture by generation thunderstorm activity. We'll still be looking at highs around 98 northeast to around 107 in isolated locations of western Nebraska. And the same conditions will exist as we get into Friday. Very warm conditions, 8 to 14 day forecast for next Thursday to the following Tuesday. Warm, above normal, precipitation, pretty much a complete lack of any significant moisture. Thanks, Al. For more information and resources related to drought management, you can visit droughtresources.unl.edu. As always, you can see any interview from this or shows in the past on our website at marketjournal.unl.edu. Next week, Darren Newsom from DTN is our market analyst, and we'll continue our coverage on dry conditions across the state. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.